It's my pleasure to welcome you here to the Clark Howard Show, where our mission is to serve you with information and advice that empowers you to make better financial decisions in your life. Well, it's Friday the 13th. Be careful out there. And today, I get to hear how scarily bad I've been in our weekly Clark Stink segment, which for me makes Friday the 13th a lucky day. By the way, it's the 13th of October, so what does that mean is coming up? Halloween. Your birthday. I think we should dress up in Halloween costumes for that episode. Your birthday, my sister's birthday. It's a big day that Halloween. Yeah. Always been. I'm your sister from another mister, right? What's that? That means you're a good friend. Oh. Sister from another mister, brother from another mother. Okay. Let's move on. Anyway, we're totally going to wear costumes on Halloween. So tune into YouTube on the Halloween episode. We're, we're really going to wear costumes? Yeah, I think we should wear costumes. Okay. Should I be a Costco employee, a Southwest airplane? Should I be a Vanguard? How would you be a Vanguard person or Fidelity or Schwab? I don't know. We could figure it out. We have a little time. We're going to plan it's gotta it It's got to be one of those themes. You need right? to get Lane involved because she's so creative. What if I was Dollar Tree? Oh, that's good. Dollar twenty-five tree. I could walk around as a Dollar See? Tree. See, those creative juices are flowing. So we could do something like that. Okay. But anyway, later, uh, moving from something so light and silly. Mm, yeah. Later, we're gonna talk about something that uh, people are having. The surprise of their lives is when they think they're gonna get this money or that money, or the other money. And it goes to somebody else because somebody didn't do the right paperwork. We're going to talk about that, how a little simple decision made long ago can cost the people you intend to have resources big time. But right now, it is time to find out how I stink big time. Okay, Clark, you don't stink, but you don't have up-to-date information on the Japan Rail Pass. Effective October 1st, the rates went up 50% to 70%. Thus, the Rail Pass is no longer a slam dunk for foreigners like it used to be. You were 100% correct that the cost of Japan on the cost of Japan. I've been about 20 times over the last 31 years. Wow. Yeah. And prices have gone from very expensive to very inexpensive. You can now get a full lunch for 1,000 yen, which is less than $7 tax and tip inclusive. David. David, gosh, I, I've fallen down on my job. I did not know that the Japan Rail Pass went through a massive price increase. And that's particularly distressing since I'm going to Japan next spring and I'll also have to pay the very high price. But it's amazing how it went from being, uh, Tokyo was by far and away the world's most expensive city at one time. And now Tokyo is still a costly city, but nothing like it was in Japan is a bargain destination, dare I say. Wow. Clark, you need to fully question your recommendation of using auto slash with rental cars. I recently used the third party company based on your recommendation and discovered there was a reservation error. Ooh. When I tried to call them on a weekend, they had no one to pick up the phone for assistance. You may save money using them until you need customer service assistance, Chad. Chad, thank you for that. I have no memory of any complaints we've had about auto slash before yours right now. But it is duly noted, and uh, gosh, I'm really sorry that they left you apparently high and yeah, dry. Yeah, I mean, when I've used it before, um, they show me the cheapest deals, but I have to click through to, in my case, I ended up booking through Priceline. You know, I took their link to Priceline, and I booked on that site. So I don't know if maybe they booked on another, they said, third-party site. So, right. Yeah. Okay, let's go to this one. Sir Clark Howard, I regret to inform you that your opinion of the anonymous writer from California's email explaining that their insurance salesman neighbor had hit their parked car but wished to go through insurance for an estimated $325 repair was very, very smelly. And they wanted to know why would someone in the insurance business do this to avoid such a minor cost? 
You stated they weren't missing anything. Well, they were most likely following their insurance company policy, as many insurance companies have fine print about reporting all incidents. And if they were to find out you did not report an incident, you could be dropped as a client, which in return could cost even more than paying for a claim. I recently found this out after reviewing my own insurance policy after I was rear-end and ha- rear-ended and having the other driver offer to write a blank check to pay for repairs. Long story short, I declined their offer. The vis- vehicle was deemed a total loss by insurance. The good news is that no one was injured, only my wallet, as I had to put that th- I'd put thousands of dollars in repairs into the car in the past two years, and I planned to keep it for many years to come. That just goes to show that plans can change in a matter of seconds, and that's why I'm glad and thankful for you and your amazing team for helping me find new ways to save more money, Dan. Dan, thank you. I mean, you were the other side of that with somebody offering you uh, cash. In in an incident, accident, where you were hit, who knows, you could have uh, unanticipated injuries from it, whatever, you don't just say, okay, we're not going to call the police. We're not going to involve insurance. Um, in the case of somebody hitting a parked car with small damage, I understand what you're saying about it potentially being against the policy, but the insurer would actually be happier if somebody just gave somebody some cash in that case, no harm, no foul, and went about their business. I would think. But I'm glad you were not hurt in that accident, just your wallet. Hello, Clark. I assumed someone would respond to your reply to the terminally ill poster who asked, what else should I do? But only crickets. He had the normal stuff taken care of, will, power of attorney, and directives. And you said he was good to go. He is not. Every year in January, I prepare a spreadsheet with, for my wife entitled Just In Case. I send it by email and store it in the cloud with a link. I've begun sending a link to my trusted son as well. It has all our accounts, login information, passwords, insurance policy numbers and amounts, recovery accounts for email, etc. It is password encrypted, but they may, that may be a little much to ask average users. The critical in- Informa- the crucial information was missing from your advice, and the person needs to make sure this info is available for the time when he is no longer able to provide it. You've covered this before, but you dropped the ball this time. Smelled like a Halloween pumpkin left out in the porch until Christmas. Tony. Did you write the thing for Tony with the Halloween theme since you love I didn't. Halloween I didn't. Theme? Tony, thank you. And um, as I've mentioned before, I update the list for my wife every 90 days. At the end of every quarter, I give her any changes with our finances or accounts or anything like that. And it's really important because somebody will be grieving losing you. And in addition, having to figure out where accounts are and all that, ugh, that's a lot to deal with. I've noticed a lot of websites no longer give the option of not accepting all cookies. There will be something that says we use cookies to optimize performance and a button to click that says OK. I've started closing that window of the browser, and if it's not something I really need to do, I'll go to that site on the Brave browser. I would like to be given the option to reject marketing cookies. Thanks, Clark, and you usually smell great, Amy. Amy, thank you. And how did I stink on that? You were one? talking about how you're you're offered to accept all cookies, or remember the pop ups. Yeah, I'm getting that. more and more of those. Are you too? Where oh, yeah. you get the the choices and uh, the Brave browser? We never talk about enough is how good it is for protecting your privacy, your information, and these smaller browsers out there, like DuckDuckGo has its version of a browser too. Uh, people really don't seem to know they're there, or if they do, they don't get around to using them. And overwhelmingly, people are with Chrome. And these other browsers provide so much more privacy to you than what you're used to. And I know that people kind of have given up on the privacy thing. Don't. Clark, your recent discussion about checks and how risky they are to use does not take into account the fact that many service people only take cash or checks for payment. Think about whenever you have someone performing a service at your residence, like a handyman, lawn service, etc. These are many times sole proprietorships or small companies that are not set up to accept credit cards for payment. I think checks will be around longer than you think, Vince. Vince, thank you. 
if you are working with a vendor like a small business person who wants to be paid only by check, then uh, if they're coming to your residence or to your business to deliver services, hand them the payment, hand them the check, do not mail it. The big problem that's happening with checks overwhelmingly is that they are truly not being lost in the mail, they're being stolen in the mail. Clark, thanks for what you do. I'm a longtime listener, but I'm tired of hearing you obsess about credit scores and chasing credit card points like they're going to make people wealthy. It seems like that's all you ever talk about. People don't get wealthy chasing credit card points or credit scores. Banks must love you. Help people by taking them out of these traps and talking them out of these traps. And please stop giving your typical excuses for doing this. Debt is the enemy. You need a large dose of Dave Ramsey. Yes, what he preaches works and gives hope. What you do doesn't. Krista, please have the courage to read this in its entirety, Donald. Donald, thank you. And I, I appreciate you writing it. I don't know why you thought we wouldn't read that. I don't know. I would have yeah. read it, yeah. Yeah. Um, so where Dave and I have disagreed all through the years is I have no problem with people using credit cards who use them as a payment system. Uh, Dave Ramsey comes at this from such a different perspective because he, as he talks about all through the years, he personally went bankrupt. And so he's really into tough love for people who've lived a debt-based lifestyle. And so he has his uh, firm lines that are part of how he gets people to get control in their lives. And his audience very much is geared towards people who've had uh, debt troubles. Our audience is not. And there are people in our audience who do have difficulties with debt, but that's not our audience principally. Our audience is principally people who are trying to figure out how to handle their assets, smartest ways to handle money. And in their case, there's nothing wrong and a lot right with using credit cards that have rewards as a way to use them as a payment system. But it only works if you are someone who pays your balances in full each and every month. And I appreciate your post. Clark, you do not smell worse than a three-week-old Limburger cheese milkshake. What's a Limburger cheese? I don't even know what that means. That's a smelly cheese. Left okay. in the sun. Oh. This is merely an observation of a language tick you have. I thought it was crazy, but it's true. You seem to never say the word car. It's always vehicle. What's the deal with that? Is car some kind of low rent word? Even a second or third reference in a sentence will have you using vehicle over and over again. <laughs> Consumer Reports, a favorite of yours, has never each spring published their annual magazine about our four-wheeled friends and called it anything other than what it is, the new car issue. Vahayim. P.S. In 2006, Disney put out an animated movie called Cars. It did $462 million in worldwide box office. I bet they never considered calling it vehicles for a second. Bradley. Bradley, thank you. Okay, so where did that come from? People used to complain that I would refer to cars, 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 and most people drive SUVs, crossovers, or pickup trucks. So I just did not adopted it as a new word. Uh, they're cars, you're right, or automobiles or whatever. But vehicle became kind of like the default that I used so that I wouldn't offend people who don't like cars. And there are a lot of people now who don't like passenger cars. They like these various other types of vehicles. Now, I drive a crossover. I drive a Tesla Model Y that is on a car platform. It was originally used for the Model 3, and it's just a car that sits up higher, has kind of like a bubble roof, looks like half an egg, and uh, it is a crossover utility vehicle, and it is a car. So thank you, and Bradley, I apologize for working your last nerve <laughs> calling cars something else, and... Uh, Sally and, uh, and Lightning McQueen really were attracted to each other in that movie. <laughs> Clark, this isn't a major stink. However, you need to stick to clean the bottom of your shoe. 
you need a stick to clean the bottom of your shoe. Looking you right warn now. people to to look at a picture picture of what their prescription should look like and compare it to what they receive from the pharmacy. Most prescription drugs have a series of letters and or numbers stamped in the in or on them. You can look up the drug online with this information and get an accurate description of what the drug depiction of what the drug is. As a bonus, it will probably show any adverse side effects. Keep up the good work, Sean. Sean, thank you. I also heard this from a pharmacist after that aired saying the same thing that I was uh, giving antiquated advice saying looking for a picture of the med that you just look up the the code on it and you'll know that it's what you're supposed to be taking and that you were not accidentally given the wrong med. For those of you who missed that episode, um, there are five million prescriptions just in California alone in the last year where people were given the wrong script and with potential life-threatening or loss of life consequences. Uh, there was just a strike by pharmacists in Kansas City, Missouri about this because they feel they're being so overworked and overquoted that people's lives, their customers' lives are being put in danger. So know that this is an issue, particularly with CVS and Walgreens, with the high production quotas. And that's why it's important from those two, and really just as a general practice, to make sure the meds you have are what the doctor wanted you to have. So uh, I appreciate that very much. You don't stink, but I have some advice for you. When someone asked you about saving money at sporting events, you didn't mention that you're allowed at a lot of sporting event venues to bring in two clear unopened bottles of water. You can also bring in snacks in clear gallon-sized Ziploc bags. Go Bills, Christine. So Christine, that game between the Bills and the Dolphins recently was one of the most fun football games I have ever seen. And those two teams are the most entertaining teams out of all 32 in the NFL. I'm sorry I upset everybody in every other place. But those two teams are just exciting to watch. Um, as for bringing in, it depends on the stadium if you're allowed to bring in outside food and beverage. But yes, what an enormous money saving that is. And I appreciate you giving that advice. And want you to know that if you hear something from me you feel is incomplete, I'm uh, out of my mind, whatever, please go to Clark.com slash Clark Stinks and post away to the benefit of me doing a better job at what I do and providing better, more complete, or correct information to your fellow listener or viewer. Coming up ahead, speaking of information for you, this whole thing about how your assets are handed off to your loved ones is something people mess up on all the time. We're going to talk about what you're supposed to do straight ahead. There are situations that occur all the time that end up where someone passes away and what that individual intended with their assets didn't actually happen. And what happened instead was the opposite of what they intended. And it's because we have busy lives and we forget things or we don't remember we did this, that, or the other in the first place. And then sometimes it's just way out there. So I want to share a story of something that happened to my late mom long, long, long ago. Um, my stepdad, when they got married, did a codicil to his will, which is a uh, addition and then a modification of his will. And in there, he said that uh, my mom, if he predeceased her, my mom would be able to live in his place for as long as she lived. So my stepdad tragically died of a heart attack and 
we have the funeral, and then we're having a family reception later. And that's when uh, one of um, the relatives asked, when was mom moving out? And asked my oldest brother, when was, when was mom moving out? And he said, oh, no, she's staying here. Um, you know, our stepdad put this codicil that she could stay the rest of her life. Well, for tax reasons, the property had gone into a trust, which meant that the will no longer mattered at all because the trust predetermined where the value, the ownership of that property was going to go. Bam. We had to move our grieving mom into an extended stay hotel till we could find a place for her to live. It was not just our mom. One day I got a knock at the door at our home and a neighbor who I didn't know well lived three doors down was crying. Her husband had just died and she found out from her stepkids that she was being evicted. And it was a similar kind of thing. There was a trust for the home. In, uh, in her now deceased husband's will, it said that she would inherit the house, but it meant nothing because the house was no longer a legal asset of him. It was in the trust. And those are extreme cases. But it's weird that the same thing that happened to my mom happened to this neighbor. It was just terrible. I mean, for a widow to already be grieving and then have no place to live, too. I mean, my goodness. That's crazy. It was a crazy story. Yeah. Um, my mom ended up fine. Everything was great. Don't worry about... Uh, but not everybody has a family there that can rally around and support. And then where are you? And those are extreme examples, but happen because so many things people do for legal or tax reasons that the overall implications, they don't know. Common example at work. Some of you will have a 401k or they'll have independent of work, they'll have an IRA or they'll have a bank account or investment account or whatever. And you're given an option of naming a beneficiary. So they name a beneficiary. Well, then life happens. And maybe you're no longer with that person. Maybe you're now with somebody else. Maybe it's a divorce and then a remarriage or whatever it is. And so you do a will and you name that you want your this asset to go to this person, this asset to go to that person, all that. Guess what? It means nothing pretty much anywhere in the country if there was a designated beneficiary that is superior in almost all cases to what's in the will. Let me tell you, we've had that question from people where the ex got the money from the investment account or the bank account or the whatever because nobody remembered there was a designated beneficiary. You know, these little instant decisions, you're filling out a form now today online. Say, would you like to designate a beneficiary? And you're like, sure. And you put in whoever, or you split it like with whoever. And then you do pass away. And it could be many decades later, hopefully. And then your money goes not where you intended but to where you did actually, in an instant, put it on a form forever before. So are you saying don't, like if you have a will, don't name beneficiaries? Don't name beneficiaries. No, just make sure. Now, this is something, if you have a lot of assets, you're, you're hopefully going to an estate attorney anyway. Mm -hmm. Like what do you consider a lot? Hmm. 
Well, that's an individual <laughs> thing. Most people consider they're really rich if they have somewhere approaching a million dollars. And so that's a point where and it's really a good idea. If you own a business, good idea to see a lawyer who does wills, estates, and trusts. I mean, there are situations, blended families, probably a good idea to go see a lawyer who does wills, estates, and trusts. And then you do that kind of housekeeping. And a lawyer who does wills, estates, and trusts, well, that's one of the questions I'll ask. Do you know if you have beneficiary designations on any of these accounts that you have? Because they'll ask you for an account list, an asset list. And then they'll say, do you have beneficiary designations? Well, most of us aren't going to have the privilege of sitting there with one of those expensive per hour estate attorneys. So we've got to do this for ourselves. When you make an asset list, if your life has been through changes over the years, which whose hasn't, you want to make sure what your beneficiary designations are, which you can usually see by signing in to your account. It'll be under uh, profile, and you change them, or uh, people who have more assets may be asked to delete beneficiary designations because it may be better for assets to pass through a will or a trust or something like that that an estate attorney would advise you on. But for uh, everyday earthlings, just remember this is an unintended consequence when stuff doesn't go where you might intend. And by the way, there are a lot of us who think we're invincible and we're going to live forever and we never do a will. That can be a really bad idea, particularly if you have minor children. You need to have a will because that's key to who ends up raising your kids. You don't want the state to decide who raises your kids for you. Okay, we'll go to questions. This is from Jennifer in Connecticut. First, please let me say thank you for all that you and the team do. My husband and I are both in our 50s, and this is both of our second marriages. We both have many kinds of financial accounts. We change the beneficiaries on both accounts to each other. I feel like if something happened to him, I would be lost financially, though, since we don't have any shared accounts. We never saw the need. We haven't seen the need yet. What should we prepare for each other just in case that we don't have that added stress? I recall you saying that you and Lane sit down once a year to go over such matters. We actually do it four times a year, Jennifer, but I guess it's because what I do for a living, it's something that we do more often than a typical person. Um, so I think it's good for a couple to have a house account, one that's a joint account, because at the time of either of your untimely demise, there may be a need to have immediate access to money that the two of you would have together other than what you each have in your own name. So even as designated beneficiary, there may be a time lag before you have access to those funds. They may require that you have a death certificate. They may require other documentation before the money would be available, and you may need access to more funds than what you each have in your own hands. So having a joint account that either of you could access in the event of the sad loss of one or the other of you, I think is a good idea. Frank in Minnesota says, I'm 60 years old and purchased a long-term care policy from Genworth when I was 43. The company was owned by GE at the time, but has since been sold to a Chinese company. My premiums have been skyrocketing in the past four years, and they are expecting them to go up another 75% in the near future. When I look at their online reviews, many give them a rating of one out of five for poor quality service, indicating a higher degree of difficulty getting paid on qualified, uh, qualified, claims. qualified claims at the time of need. What advice do you have for those of us in this situation? And I uh, gave you a link as well um, to Genworth's site where they talk about the rising premiums. Oh, I'm, I, I don't need to read their site. This is a problem in the long-term care insurance business. As a general rule, virtually without exception, there's no equity you've built up over all these years um, 
17 years mm -hmm. of ownership of the policy, no equity. So you either take it on the chin and accept a reduced benefit under the policy for a lower premium, or these policies that are older are in what they call in the insurance industry a death spiral. The only people that are continuing to pay the premiums in what's known as adverse selection are people who are uh, facing difficulties health-wise and they'll pay whatever to keep the policy in place. And then the premiums, as people fall by the wayside, as the premiums go up, you end up with a pool of people who are motivated because they need the benefit or expect they soon will. And so the thing spirals out of control and basically uh, the policies become impossible to keep in place. Uh, Genworth has a long history of controversy involved in the long-term care industry for being difficult to get claims paid just as you related to. So this one is a really hard one. Uh, you can either look at it as if you continue to pay, are you throwing good money after bad? Or should you do so? And I would say you're 60 years old, which is about the age I like for people to buy long-term care insurance policies, ironically enough, late 50s, early 60s. You might be better off allowing this policy to lapse and coming up with a fresh start on long-term care. I mean, this one's so hard to call because the premiums are not guaranteed. And at 60, you may not need this for another 20, 25 years. There are alternatives now. And the one that's been uh, popular the last five or so years is what's known as a hybrid policy where you have a guaranteed benefit for a set premium instead of an open-ended benefit like this would involve. So I don't want you to just go ahead and dump this. I want you to do research. And I want you to see if, if it makes sense for you to continue to pay. And if, you're, if you can medically underwrite, in other words, you're in good health now at age 60, it may be better for you to let this one die and you get something else as a replacement like one of the hybrids. Simplest form of a hybrid. You buy a traditional whole life insurance policy with a long-term care rider that allows you to use the face amount of the policy as a living benefit instead of a death benefit for the amount of coverage that you buy for a premium that's clear and set. Yeah, you hate whole life normally, so people I are going to gasp at that suggestion. Uh, but it's it's a vehicle that's worked for the purpose. Remember I said you turn into a living benefit. Right, right. And if you never need it for that, then there's a benefit for heirs or your favorite charity to receive at time of your passing. Dana in Alabama says, my husband just applied for a credit card with our bank after receiving a great cashback offer. We both have excellent credit and received our cards in the mail yesterday. However, after reading more of the fine print, the great cashback percentages are based on having $15,000 in our accounts with the bank. We have never kept that much money in our bank's checking and savings accounts because we know there are better ways to use those funds. We haven't activated the cards. We really just want to cancel the cards, but are afraid it will hurt our credit long term since we know the new credit account is technically already open. What is our best option? So, uh, is it Dana or Dana? It's D A N A. <laughs> D A N A. I assume Dana. Dana. It's usually Dana. Dana or Dana. Um, this is such a bait and switch. Uh, I think I mentioned the other day there's a bank that's offering these great rates on CDs, but it turns out you only get the great rates if you have $5 million. <laughs> oh, man. Can you believe that? Uh, anyway. In this case, the hit to your credit for having done an application for new credit is temporary and very small. It's a low impact factor in setting your credit score, credit standing. So if basically this was an oops, 
where there's no value in getting these cards, um, if they have no annual fee, you could just let them sit and not use them. And then you have that available credit in your mix. Or you could go ahead and just cut your losses, not activate, not have the account. And that would be fine too. Because uh, it's, it's not going to have big impact. The only thing that does have big impact, there are two factors. They're the only two things that ultimately really bend the curve on your credit standing and credit score. And that's paying every bill every month on time. And second, using a low amount of your available credit. If this 15, no, I, you didn't say what the limit is, 15,000 you had to have in the checking account. If you have a decent number of credit cards and decent available credit, you're good. You're fine. Even if you give this uh, new card heave ho, you also might consider that a bank that does a bait and switch like this, maybe they're not the bank you should be with for your banking if they're just not straight, honest, out and out with the offers they make to you as a customer. And I want to tell you, we have hit the end of our podcast week. It's Friday. And I hope you have an absolutely great weekend. If you tune into this Friday podcast on the weekend, I hope you're in the midst of an absolutely great weekend. And remember what we're about, that you save more, spend less, and don't let anyone ever rip you off.